So we're here at Basque in the wetland area, and there's also a pond here that was expanded from a natural uh, low point. And it's home to at least three or four species of frogs that we've heard thus far, uh, and quite a few plants that are obligate wetland species that must have consistent moisture in their soil uh, for these plants to thrive. And we'll show you a few of those as we walk this way. Over on the other side of this uh, drainage area is the purple fringeless orchid. Uh, and it is pretty rare. Uh, it's a terrestrial orchid that occurs in wetland areas like this. Uh, and it is pollinated by the clear wing hummingbird moth, which looks kind of like a hummingbird, even though it's a very large hawk moth. So as we're walking around today, uh, many species like that are what some people call storyteller species. And these storyteller species tell you what the environment used to be like if it's evolved or it's been uh, pressured by human interaction like farming, which is the case on this site. So anywhere that farmers couldn't get to with a plow or couldn't access easily for grazing has a lot of endemic species that are quite rare in other parts of Middle Tennessee. One of the first things that we're going to be doing on site is removal of invasive species. So there's a few aquatic invasive species in the pond, and there are a number of them on the edges of the uh, water and also deeper into the wetlands. And so our biggest push right now as Basque is developed is to eliminate all the invasive species so that the native species can thrive without the competition, which is largely unfair, as uh, invasive species often leaf out before everything else that's native. They often stay leafed out longer than the native species, and so they just have more energy to outcompete native species, and it's really just not a fair race. And so we're going to become involved in that respect for the wetlands, but after that we're not going to be manipulating the plants or moving them around or adding much. We're just going to see what's here and allow it to thrive. So in front of us here is a, what they call a European pasture. These are all non-native plants. Roughly 80 to 90 percent of this field is not native species. And we're going to be removing those and replacing it with both dry and wet meadow plants. Many of the wetland meadow plants are already here in front of us, but they've been suppressed from bush, uh, bush hogging um, and uh, uh, agricultural practices like, uh, I believe they had a pig farm here. Uh, but cattle have also grazed this field too. So everything closer to this pond and the marsh has a lot of more native species for the wetland meadow than the, the drier part up the hill from us. So this wetland edge we're going to restore and remove all of these fescue and other types of invasive plants and we'll add more of the sedges, the silky willow, the alder. Uh, there's button bush over here that we'll look at in a minute. Uh, and then there's also this plant here in the back, which is called water hemlock. And uh, it's very poisonous to people and animals. I read that the Cherokee Nation folks used it to kill crows in their agricultural crops. Uh, and I would imagine that uh, it was used for other things as well. Uh, but that's one plant that we won't be um, touching with bare skin. Uh, and there's a few other toxic plants in the marsh area. Uh, but um, as far as where we're at today, uh, this area here has been largely unmanaged and our goal in the short term again is to get rid of all the invasives and then figure out areas where certain species really thrive and add more seedlings, cut it, rooted cuttings or um, other propagules to fill them out.
So back there with all the moths and bees and dragonflies and everything on it is Cephalanthus occidentalis, also known as buttonbush. And it has a sphere-shaped flower head uh, that produces a ton of nectar for a lot of pollinators. And this is an indicator species for uh, wetlands. And then up on the top left of it, there's actually a butterfly getting some nectar as well. So we're going to be adding a lot more of those along with alder, which is this plant right here. And alder grows in creeks and on the edges of creeks and ponds. And the larger version of it, as it matures, gets about 15 to 18 feet tall and wide. And they form thickets in wetlands like this. Below it, we've got silky willow all the way along this pond edge. And those can be propagated in the winter from stem cuttings that you just shove into the ground. Another plant that you can propagate that way in this marsh is called silky willow. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not silky willow. Uh, there's another plant in this marsh uh, that's called silky dogwood, and we're going to go see some of those next. And those can also be propagated in the winter using like one to two foot uh, stem cuttings. They're dormant. You just shove them in the ground and they'll root over winter um, and fill in. Let's see if we can find a silky dogwood. Here's more of that button bush uh, about to bloom. And then right next to it, we've got our native groundnut, which is Apios americana. And Apios americana is a tuber producing vine that doesn't have a woody stem, but it does produce a string of uh, tubers that you can actually eat. And the indigenous groups in this area farmed it uh, extensively for many, many years. We'll be producing this uh, for food uh, at some point. But this is an environment where it really likes to grow uh, near water in usually disturbed soil and uh, if this was a, a tree, there was a tree available, you can see another one growing up this um, cedar next to you. And that's what it usually does. It should be blooming now or in the next month or so. And then silky dogwood, I don't see any around here, uh, but I'm sure there's some further down. And that's another indicator species of a wetland. So in the water right here is another species uh, that's somewhat rare and it's got an arrowhead shaped leaf and it's called broadleaf arrowhead or Indian potato. And that's another starchy tuber uh, that was grown by indigenous groups uh, for food. And another indicator that I feel that this site was at one point a settlement due to the high concentration of edible food crops that are indigenous plants that are here. There's just so many everywhere that it makes sense that this used to be a settlement at one time. But that's a great plant to propagate um, in wetlands or in standing water, and we're gonna be doing that here as well. Wow, there's a bunch of button bush back here. Still don't see any of the dogwood yet. But yeah, huge population of button bush, lots more alder thickets. Uh, this is an incredibly biologically diverse area and we have tons of wildlife hidden here all the time, especially butterflies and moths. I'm not sure what this one is. It looks like the Veronicastrum, but I'm not sure. We have so many plants at the Basque site that are endemic um, that I'm kind of overwhelmed at sometimes 
trying to figure out what some of them are. We have roughly, I would guess, between 200 and 300 species of plants here. I'm not sure yet, as we are assaying that now. However, every time I walk around the property, I see more plants like this. Then we use iNaturalist to identify if they're invasive or native, or we consult a botanist. And as we identify everything, uh, we'll get a big list, and then we'll know what we have, and we can start propagating uh, from both seed and cuttings and divisions with what we have here. And instead of buying a ton of plants, we'll propagate in-house.